All right, I think we're live. So welcome to everybody for day two of the 2020 Cloud Security Executive Summit. Uh, we've got a great, great day lined up for you guys today. And it's been amazing. I've been watching this morning. There have been folks on that have been on for over two hours in the chat room. And so we're just super excited to have you there. And we've just got, again, a great day lined up. But, you know, let's dive right into it, right? I mean, we we just have this initial session, which I think we're sharing. There we go. We're going to lead it off today with a great panel uh, talking to Viacom CBS. We've got Jeremiah Gearhart and Sadie Steffel, both from uh, Viacom CBS. And we're going to be talking about uh, really how to drive friction-free innovation by bringing together DevOps and, uh, and security. And so with that, let's, let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about our speakers. Jeremiah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't, why don't you kick us off? Um, love to hear more about you and, and how you come to this crazy cloud world. Yeah, sure. So uh, good morning, everyone. Jeremiah Gearhart. Um, kind of been in IT now for, I mean, I guess it's been almost uh, 15 years. So started out more uh, on the network architecture side and then kind of just as things went on, went into cloud architecture and then cloud security. Um, so the way that we kind of came uh, to be with um, with Divi Cloud is, uh, you know, kind of at Google Next uh, a couple years ago now, we had a, you know, Super Bowl is one of the big uh, items that we had. Security kind of uh, was behind in, in some aspects there. So Divi Cloud really helped us. Uh, you know, get up to speed, get the visibility we needed into uh, that account, plus, you know, all the other many business units that we have. Excellent. And Sadie, welcome. Hello. Hi. Yeah, my name is Sadie Steffel. Um, I'm a cloud security engineer. So whatever Jeremiah builds, I'm more of the uh, organizer um, and making sure that our units follow through. Um, so I think that while we're introducing ourselves, I oh, also want to introduce a little bit about, you know, uh, our organization. So that way, when we reference specific things, you'll understand what we're saying. Um, but Jeremiah and I, when we say units, uh, we have a centralized InfoSec team, um, and a unit refers to one of our media media businesses, right? So it could be Showtime, it could be CBS Sports, it could be news. Um, so we kind of rotate around and move around all of our different units. So you'll hear us hear that phrase quite frequently. It's but when we say units, we're talking about one of the one of our media business units. Okay. Excellent. Well, before we dive right into it, um, what I'd love to, to kind of understand a little bit more is just kind of, and, and I think you talked a little bit, Jeremiah, about how you guys started thinking about security. But when you guys, when Viacom thinks about innovation, um, you know, what what led you down the journey of cloud and, and what were some of the thoughts and expectations or maybe some of the benefits that, that the team thought it was going to bring? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, really, I guess you know, around two years ago, our team was formed, um, kind of right when there was a lot of cloud migrations going on. But also uh, during that time, you know, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, the Super Bowl was the big hot item, but we also had uh, CNET, which is one of the, the top ten, you know, web entities in, in the world. Um, CBS Sports in general, you know, everybody was kind of migrating at the same time out of on-prem environments. Uh, so our entire like first year and a half was all about trying to get visibility as quickly as possible because we honestly didn't know uh, all the accounts that were out there, you know, what issues existed uh, because, you know, as everybody knows right now, when you migrate from on-prem to cloud, there's no really, everybody talks about lift and shift. You know, that's, that, you know, that, that, that term just needs to kind of be thrown out because that just doesn't happen anymore. The cloud brings a lot of additional, you know, ways in and things we need to secure. So, uh, kind of with that, when we went to Google Next, uh, Divi Cloud was the uh, the tool that you know we actually uh, myself and one of the other architects ran across, but also our CISO at the time, he went to the exact same booth, and we were both were you know trying to find each other to, to talk about you know this great tool that we found. Um, so everybody was on board really quick. The Divi Cloud support team, which I you know can't say enough good things about. Um, just with other vendors that I work with, they, they're by far the best and most supportive when, you know, doing a pilot, kind of going from start to finish. 
And the, kind of the way that we were able to incorporate that very quickly is with the relationships that we've built mm -hmm. with our development teams, with our cloud architecture team, we were able to integrate, you know, basically Terraform modules that, you know, as soon as a, a cloud is uh, bootstrapped or an account is bootstrapped, all of our security tools, the roles that Divi Cloud needs to assume yeah. to start monitoring that account all gets pushed out right at the beginning. Very cool. And I, I know we're going to dive well into that. And then, but, you know, Sadie, from the, you know, from the, your analyst side, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, Viacom being a, you know, a long-term company that you guys were a data center based firm. And then, you know, as, as Jeremiah talked about these migrations, um, you know, was there an expectation there from the development teams? And, you know, did, did you guys have to think differently initially out of the gate before we kind of get into talking about, you know, the shifts in security itself, but really just a whole mindset and skill set? Yeah, so I think that's a really great question. Uh, when it comes to working with our development team, you know, the first thing that I would say, you know, setting the standard is we're here to work with you. We're here to make you look successful. You know, I'm not here to make your job harder. If you're feeling overwhelmed or overloaded or anything at all, please send up the white flag because that's the last thing that I'm needing to do. Yeah. So I think culturally when we set that up front of, you know, we're here to make you look good. Let's do this together without overwhelming each other. Um, and kind of let's look at the big picture and then let's digest it, right? And let's figure out, you know, what's going to work now? What's going to work next quarter? What's going to work third quarter? And how do we get this thing really taken off? Very cool. Well, and then that that you know leads right into kind of um, you know. You know, this whole concept around security democratization, right? And I, and I think you, you touch on it being a partnership, right? And it, it really is that ultimate shift of moving from, for most folks, and this isn't in every organization, but having a very centralized security group to everyone thinking about security in a, in a broad way. And I'll, I'll tell you, and I, and I didn't do a broad introduction around myself, but you know, um, I spent uh, 25 years at General Electric um, in, in many different roles uh, in CIO and CTO capacities across most of the industrial businesses. But my last role at the company was was owning application transformation for the company. And w one of the things uh, that we saw there, as well as that I continue to see with our clients at Nefosec is, particularly in the enterprise space, if the company didn't wasn't born in the cloud, Typically, it's going to have to make that mental shift between having gone from a, a very stringent set of procedures and processes that were aligned much more to, to big iron infrastructure inside a company-owned or co data center. And so typically what we've seen is that most of these clients have a very traditional uh, centralized IT security team that's driven by individual reviews and approval based on that required architecture tied to the application inside the data center. And, and, and really what we found is it's just not cloud scalable, right? Certainly not scalable at the speed of cloud. And, you know, uh, Jeremiah, why don't we kick off with you to kind of talk about, you know, as we've gone through this together, right, that, that you guys have moved to a model that looks like this. And um, why don't we kind of kick off about how that started, uh, but also kind of some of the the organizational discussions and changes that needed to occur and kind of how you guys led that way and then start walking me through and Sadie jump in along the way. And I know you're, you're, you, you spent a lot of time on that backside. So I'm going to let this kind of play out. Yeah, sure. So um, really from the very beginning, you know, what we found uh, to really help in the success of rolling this out is getting in uh, very early on um, essentially with the, you know, j just meeting with the developers, with the app owners, and, you know, here at, at uh, Viacom CBS, we have a cloud architecture team as well, which we're heavily integrated with. And, you know, just all those uh, uh, different folks, you know, we, we have kind of a, a weekly or biweekly meeting, discuss the actual scope, uh, you know, of what they're migrating, what needs to be built. And with that, you know, we work with the centralized architecture team, which handles a lot of the core resources in AWS and GCP. So anything from standing up the GKE clusters, the IAM roles, uh, storage, um, all, all those different aspects, the security groups, um, we work with that team uh, to start kind of integrating the uh, you know the security standards. 
mm -hmm. that uh, into those terraform modules because you know we're a heavy, heavy terraform shop everything you know is tried to you know be done through uh, through code at this point and almost has to be if you want to have a chance of you know you have to get rid of click ops you can't you know that doesn't scale as well as everybody knows and if any of that is going on you'll never you know have that that standardization you'll always have some some loophole you know yeah. that, that you know something that gets open that that, that shouldn't be so um that's kind of how you know just we, we started with it but you know as this kind of picture shows you know to eliminate that continuous uh, or the, the the drift you know through continuous monitoring the bots and different things that you know that SETI built within divi cloud to you know continuously go back and check She's going back, uh, you know, on a weekly, monthly standpoint now to, you know, those checks run. We have uh, Slack channels, you know, that, that we've also turned up. So all those alerts, we're heavy Slack shop as well. We found that's the probably preferred method to just really get, um, you know, the the insights and the results and alerts back to the, to not just us, but also directly to the, those business owners. Yeah. Uh, and then she's done a good job of uh, adding priorities to, you know, ones that are in you know, a more critical items. So we can hit those first and then just scheduling those to be rolled out. Gotcha. And, you know, Sadie, kind of thinking back into that process, how, how have you guys as not only analysts, but just really from a security mindset being on the, the, the end of checking, how have you reached back or has the team kind of reached back into not only kind of defining what good looks like, but, but also how those deployment modules, uh, is there a feedback loop there and how does that kind of work? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the first thing to start off is, you know, after it's been scanned and deployed and everything like that, then it's kind of more on that third quarter of the way that post, just making sure that if anything is created or modified, right? Because if somebody goes back in and makes a change, they open the board or has some sort of IM configuration, we also need to know about that. Yeah. So uh, it goes off in the Slack channels and as he was talking about, you know, the business unit, unit um, and they're quick. Like if something goes off on that Slack channel, our units are very quick to respond to it. Then to bring it back up to the full circle is, you know, sometimes if we have a project that we know is starting off um, and it hasn't been written any code or anything yet, we will go ahead and build out the box beforehand as well and spin up the Slack, Slack channel. So, you know, as they're building and something goes off, then they're aware as they're building it. And then by the time they come to ask for, you know, um, security's write off, it, the launch time is little to none because, I mean, they've been working with it in their Slack channel the whole time. Gotcha. Feedback on the bots themselves, I mean, it's always continuous, right? Even if a bot goes off and they say, you know, everybody will comment about it. And then generally we have like a quarterly review of what's been built out, you know, we're working next, et cetera. Excellent. So it, it's kind of, if I was to summarize back, it's, it's taking what good looks like, right? And then, and then ensuring that you guys are involved very early on to ensure that as the teams are beginning to build that out, that it is not only done with those security architects, but that you are leveraging the best practices out of the Legos uh, prior to deployment to ensure that the team is already rocking and rolling by the time deploy gets there. So, yeah, exactly. I love it. I love it. That's excellent. <laughs> well, let's, uh, from there, kind of begin to talk about you know, shifting left and, and you guys have already hit on a ton of it, but you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's that major shift that we're seeing. And I know you guys are already because of Terraform leveraging those, those capabilities that are within Divi cloud and, and want to talk about for, for those who may not understand it. Right. I mean, there's, as, as Sadie talked about, right. There's always that aspect of, of understanding, you know, and having visibility to what's been created. Um, and and monitoring that for drift, but I think one of the the, the, the special things that, that Viacom has done is is to really begin to to leverage that whole shift left and think about uh, infrastructure as code and 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 I want to you know dive into that and and thinking about so I'm going to turn it o turn it over um, you know we talked we touched on it but how has the team thought about that uh, in your pre pre flight checks and, and what does that look like in Viacom? Yeah, so this was honestly, um, you know, we got to take part in sort of the uh, the, the beta uh, testing with this and pilot this out. So uh, super excited about it, mainly you know, because we are such a, a large Terraform shop and 
Um, you know, most other places now are also going to be using Terraform over something like CloudFormation or uh, mm -hmm. your Azure ARM templates, uh, just because, you know, cloud agnostics, you can use it across the board. Um, it, so the great thing here, uh, a lot of, and of course, it's got really got the developers excited as well is you know all of the all of the insights that you now have once a resource is created that you know uh, with the original version you had to wait until that resource is turned up potentially that issue is going to be introduced and then you know you're going to go back and check now with incorporating the iec module or feature that divi cloud now has all those exact same insights all those checks are going to now you know be uh, kind of validated against that terraform plan Mm -hmm. And just through the API calls, you can now, you know, CICD pipeline kicks off. They make a, a Terraform change. It's going to, let's say, make a security group change. And now that insight that would, uh, you know, have checked for, let's say, you know, SSH up into the world, right. uh, for instance, that's going to be caught within that plan before that resource is even created, before that issue is introduced. So not only is that going to save you on resource cost, that's yeah. now going to get that problem fixed before, I mean, before it even happens. So that's, you know, being able to do that, and it, it's very simple to do, you know, Jenkins pipelines, uh, any of the other uh, tools that are out there, very easy to, to, to roll out, uh, so PRs push, build that into the, the pipeline. Okay. And then from there, you can then kick off, you know, even if it's a JIRA request or just a Slack alert. And, you know, those things are gonna be fixed before it's even introduced into the environment. I wanna, I wanna come back to that, but the next thing I wanna ask, with, with the introduction of that, Sadie, did you begin to see, once the team started implementing that, uh, a reduction in, in things post-flight that you were having to resolve with your bots post-deployment? Post I began to see a lot of things, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> even one of them I thought was so fascinating. Somehow this like checklist uh, ended up on my Slack, you know, as you're building, make sure to do this, 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 this. And I was like, who the heck built this thing? I mean, I found out later who built it, but I thought it was just so fascinating, you know, that now that because we are shifting left and we have all these security controls and things that we're looking for even beforehand, now, now this checklist has populated up and people are very thorough with it. And the other thing that's also uh, was the result of it, it's just launch times with our apps are, you know, when they come for a sign off, it's super quick. We're not spending a lot of time hammering back on devs, go back and fix this, fix that. So they're not really getting frustrated with us at the end. You know, and by the time the end comes, everybody's pretty good to go. Everything's looking really clean. Very cool. And I'm going to toss this out to both of you. And, and so you talk about it sounds like it went really, really well. Sadie. I mean, that the folks welcomed it. But I, I want to I'm going to ask you quite pointedly, and that is, is what, what did the development teams think when they started having this stuff show up, whether it was in their individual Slack channel or suddenly that's saying, you know, in some ways might, some folks might perceive it as, you know, you, you've done it wrong, right? And and so was it, was it, was it welcomed? Uh, was it viewed as a cultural shift? Uh, tell me, talk, walk me through that a little bit. Yeah, so like I said at the beginning, you know, being open and honest and knowing that like, your team and you're in this together, you know, and that it's going to be a learning experience for everyone. Um, and having that perception of, you know, I, we're here to make everybody look good and we're all on the same team and just making sure that everybody's on that same sort of mindset before you start off. So it's like, okay, you know, if I tell you that something is wrong within this template, let's talk about it, right? Let's figure out what's going to be the best, easiest, feasible way. If I'm wrong, you know, let's go through it. But, you know, let's figure out where this is at, what this means, how we can fix it, and what it's going to mean to the business unit. Yeah. And so I'm going to build on that a little bit, Jeremiah. Um, you, so it sounds like the, de the developers are allowed to modify the, the Terraform, and if not, correct me. Um, what, kind of what's that process? And, I mean, do, do they... Do they see that checklist and go make the changes themselves? Does that have to go back through a, a review process? Or have you guys gotten to the point in that maturity curve that you guys have been able to truly democratize in that way? Yeah, uh, we have there. So a lot with, with the, the actual Terraform, going back to the um, uh, that centralized architecture team that, that we're kind of heavily integrated with. So, you know, if something does come up, you know, there does need to be maybe an, an exception to one of those rules. They, they're really good about, um, you know, they are kind of security, had that security focus mindset already. And, uh, you know, they just, it's either a Slack, you know, a quick Slack to us or 
um, even in a quick meeting. And if there is something that needs to be changed or updated, um, it's really ju just done through that. We, we work with them either, you know, myself, uh, somebody on my team can actually edit the, the Terraform code, push the PR, or they do it and we just do a quick approval process, uh, you know, kind of approve that request. And then, you know, it's that's really all there is to it. And then that new uh, uh, change is updated to the code and pushed out. Gotcha. Um, by the way, I, and, I, and I should have mentioned at the very beginning of the session to everyone who's listening right now, we're, we are going to leave some time for Q&A at the end, but in your chat channel, you can actually be asking questions along the way, and I will be watching those. I will try to uh, work them in, and if, if I can't, we'll, we'll certainly get them towards the end. So uh, I wanted to bring that up also. Well, you know, so, you know, we've talked about shifting left and, and then, you know, we've got that preventative piece and now we're going to talk a little bit about protection and, um, Sadie, I'm going to kind of maybe kick it over to you a little bit to talk about, you know, what, what this has meant to you from getting that data unified and then how your team has thought about corrective action. And, and, you know, so sounds like, again, that you guys have all been, you know, for the most part on the same page for a launch, but, but what happens after that in, in, how have you guys thought about it that way in, in your in your actionability, if you will? Yeah, so when it comes to Jiffy Code, uh, there's lots of different like insights, right? There's, uh, and an insight is basically some sort of control. So, you know, there's level five, four, three, you know, there's risk, there's compliance, there's security. So we really took a lot of uh, analysis when we said, okay, you know, these or these insights, these are security ones. These are critical, these are top level, you know, we need to roll these out first to all the unit um, and make sure that they get comfortable in working with, you know, how we're gonna make the change and how it can be rolled out and how we're gonna continuously monitor it. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I guess we rolled it out in different phases is the best way to explain it. Phase one was anything, you know, top critical. Phase two was more of like IAM. Um, phase three, you know, so you got to kind of figure out what's going to be the most digestible thing for your organization um, and how it's going to go smoothly when it's rolled out. So, you know, after we have implemented it and we begin to see the changes, then the bots are built, right? So that way, if anybody tries to come back and make any changes or build something new within that same sort of uh, Terraform, then you know we know about it. So we're not constantly playing whack-a-mole. Yep. Um, yeah. And the other thing that we did too is when we looked at the big picture of you know 90 days, 90 days, 90 days, 90 days. We uh, really utilized their their packs, uh, their different packs. You know, so they have NIST, they have AWS, they have GCP. Together, our framework that we want to map to, and we also included that in the digestible 90-90-90. So you know, by the time that we hit our goal, not only are our high criticals taken care of. But we've also mapped to, you know, a NIST or an ISO. So we're running all parallel at the same time with everything. And it's continuously monitoring and checking it. And so, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask to build on that a little bit. And then, Jeremy, I want to come back to you about what that yep. means after it fires. But, Sadie, I mean, did you guys in those 90, 90, 90s, um, in that approach, did you start initially with strictly notifications? And then kind of how did that, from an automation, how did that begin to progress? Uh, and, 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 and what did leadership think about it for, as you guys talked about starting to have this all of a sudden this tool taking some action if you will yeah i mean the first thing is leadership is always going to be about metrics right yeah. they always want to see how the money is spent how it's performing so you know just to make sure that this is where we were within our network right we had x amount of you know maybe a coach port whatever open and uh, now we have zero of them so in that result right we went from here to there and different cloud has done a really good job at upgrading their um their reporting so that way it can be automated you can see where you were 90 days ago etc yeah. um and at first you know once you kind of figure out okay this is what we have this is what we want to roll out um we wanted to make sure that when we started the bot automation, that it wasn't going to be something that was noisy, right? Because noise, people just tend to kind of push it away and they do the opposite. They don't like, if I have 300 alerts, I'm overwhelmed. Right. right. I, I, 
So we wanted to make it so that way the teams were looking at 20 alerts a week, okay. right? So, oh, so you introduced those over time. Yeah, we, we wanted to make sure that if an alert popped up, that it was meaningful and that they would take action on it and that I wasn't going to be spamming them. Right. So on a week by week basis, as I rolled it out, we could really start to see things drop um, and start to comply with what we were asking. Very good, wow. I, and um, and so Jeremiah, I wanna build on that a little bit and come back to, okay, so folks are taking care of things. Is there is there a way that you guys, um, you know, and I'm, I'm guessing it's part of that shift left, but 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 how are you guys ensuring that, that the Terraform is being updated and, and there isn't that whack-a-mole that, that Sadie kind of talked about preventing? Yeah, so uh, probably the, the biggest deal with that is going to be um, just where the, the insights and bots and things that, that we've built and Sadie's built. And uh, going back really quick to where she talked about the, uh, the packs, um, so that was one, the, the way that we rolled out very quickly is all the rule sets. You know, if you wanted to, if you needed to map to a NIST, the PCI compliance, any of those, that's already in there. But what yeah. we were able to do and to cut down on those initial alerts is we kind of, you know, we're able to create a custom pack from all like the, the really big critical rules out of, you know, from all those uh, different rule sets. And that that's what uh, we were able to implement first. Uh, but. Uh, the thing with now putting that into the IEC and monitoring that code for any changes that come up that would violate that, any insight that we create or is added to Divi Cloud, those are going to be automatically checked uh, through the IEC module in Divi. So um, anything that's added there is now going to be able to be checked within the code. So if something new comes up, like let's say a new rule was added to uh, you know, deny you know a, a new port at the boundary or there, there was another um, just vulnerability that showed up, you know, within one of the new updates, that's automatically going to get pushed. So all yeah. that's already done. Um, well, you know, and all this comes back to, uh, to, to, to driving innovation, right? And, and so I, I guess my question to you both is, is what, what has this meant, right? So it sounds like, you know, the, the teams are feeling, you know, much more confident about, uh, what they deploy is is going to 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 be secure for the enterprise, and, and what has that meant from the aspect of speed, speed in deployment, um, you know, speed to build, all those aspects that ultimately we're trying to drive that friction free innovation, right? Can we talk a little bit about that? And I'm going to open it up to both of you, please. Yeah. So, do you want to go first? Your phone. Yeah, so I think it means just honestly being a lot of consistent, right? It's like having a puppy, making sure you're doing the same things all the time. So that way everybody's on the same schedule culturally. They know what you're going to ask them to do. Um, you know, then they start to kind of get it in their brain of what they're asked to do. Um, so that way, you know, we're not all over the place. We're running parallel together. And you really start to see, you know, your DevOps already think about what you're going to ask. And so then they start to, you know, you, you start to move all together. Um, and then by the time, you know, you're building and launching all these apps, you're getting a lot quicker and efficient at it. Gotcha. And just adding to that really quick, you know, again, the, a big thing for us was just from the very beginning, really opening up those communication lines, uh, you know, as said, you talked about, you know, we don't want to, you know, just be, you know, a lot of times security trust to, to get implemented at the very end or they catch something and they're like, Hey, you've got to, you got to fix this. Yeah. You know, there's no more gates in there. Right. So we're able to, once we're incorporated at the very beginning, they know that we're working with us. We're not trying to, you know, stop them, you know, have to fix this later on and completely make all these changes. So we're able to kind of roll with them as they're making these new releases and things. And that's really helped us uh, just continue to move quickly. That's important. I, I always just tell them I'm here to make you look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that one away. Definitely. <laughs> that is ultimately the goal, right? Um, we, we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but um, I do want to come back to one point that's still in my head. And then I, okay, for those for those listening in, please do start the questions coming in. And I've, I've, I've seen one pop in that I'm going to ask here in a minute. But um, how about drift? Um, let's talk a little bit about drift. So you guys have done all this great stuff, um, you know, on the launch. And Sadie, why don't you touch on a little bit about, you know, because of all this, are you seeing that reduction in drift and are you still seeing it at all? 
think we'll see it every now and then. You know, it still kind of pops up, but uh, Divi Club within their bot automation does a really great job. But if anything is uh, modified or that is newly created on something that we've already gone and approved and launched and shut. Um, so, and because culturally our, our units are so used to working with Slack now when something goes off, you know, if drift happens, um, something will go up on the Slack channel and they're super quick to respond, you know, they've been working with, with it for a while. They know off the top of their head. I, I'll, I'll see it usually right away. Like, oh, that's me just, you know, testing something or whatever it might be. So uh that that continuously monitoring with the bot automation really helps close that gap for drift right um and culturally yeah, because we're so used to just working together and on the same team everybody's fairly quick to respond to you know something that might have been modified or created very cool yeah real real quick on that the just from a, an architecture perspective that's really helped us um that that isn't uh, easy to do but we've been able to do it here is you know it's very important uh, especially for these security checks and you know uh, catching the drift is having a very you know your development environment your staging environment you know i'm trying to make those as much of a mirror copy as possible yep. so we're going to catch that very early on you know in those checks and we can even have some you know extra things going on to test there and then you know once it's checked there you know everything is automated there's no uh, there's definitely no click ops or anything that's going to be pushed to production it's all goes through that that pipeline it's going to be caught in one of those earlier stages and those mirrored accounts before it even makes it to production so that's been a huge a huge uh, had a huge impact for us there cool cool and we do heavily utilize our ticketing system as well okay. so there's an integration with Divi cloud and but that way, you know, if somebody has any questions, let's say the CTO has a question about why a storage container is open or something along those lines, you know, she can go in and search the name of that storage container and kind of see all the different revisions or comments, things that might have the security team might have said, then pass it to the architecture team and, you know, see that collaboration for why something is the way that it is. Excellent. That's another, certainly another best practice to, to consider for the teams. Um, I, I have uh, one question so far that's popped in. Um, it says, I can see how shifting left can work with cloud infrastructure deployments, but what is your perspective on how it does or will work with serverless deployments and checks? Yeah, so, I mean, on the serverless side, a lot of what you're going to see there and, and one to point out, um, especially just on the, the Kubernetes and con containerization side really quick, Divi Cloud now has, uh, uh, I guess, a, a Kubernetes module where you can feed it a kubeconfig file. Uh -huh. you know, you're going to get additional insights into uh, your actual containers, uh, some of the IAM and RBAC roles, you know, to, you're kind of able to start checking things within the cluster itself, um, which, which is one, um, one big item there. But a lot of what uh, the drift and those like code bases and things like that, you know, they're going to still need security groups. They're going to need, um, you know, application gateways and things that are going to need to be checked. So a lot of those same resources that are used outside of serverless are still going to be checked and uh, used in that uh, same mentality. Gotcha. And Divi Cloud does have, a, again, a set of insights or controls that apply to serverless as well. Very good. Yep. Excellent. Uh, another question's come in from Alunga Newman. Uh, how much latitude should one allow application support teams in a multi-cloud environment without becoming too controlling that can uh, negate the benefits of cloud? So how do we how do we provide that friction-free innovation and opportunities to experiment? Should we should we uh, be trying to look at environments differently between non-prod and prod? And she's uh, added on that we're trying to uh, migrate our minds from legacy on-prem to thinking about the new future. So how do you, how do you not feel like a, a, a ticketing system that's locked you down in that old world? Yeah, I mean, again, so in the development environment, what's really helped us, especially like testing new bots and uh, and things, if they're, you know, we did need to maybe loosen some of the restrictions, for instance, you know, get that, you know, Divi Cloud cluster, your dev cluster set up and do all of your testing there. And you actually can have that, uh, uh, not your prod cluster checking the development environments, but your actual dev cluster, same rule sets and everything, but you can make changes there. Everything works out. Then, you know, you can uh, you know look at pushing that new insight or, or change you made to the prod environment. 
Gotcha. Migrating the mind. I'm definitely taking that home. I know. I like that. <laughs> um, but I would also say, you know, have, like, for us, I will go to my units or one of my teams and say, you know, okay, this is, this is what I'm asking for. What are some things that you're concerned about, right? What are some things that you would also like to hear about in your environment? You know, I can work on those too. I can build those for you as well. Um, even though it may not, it might be like a, a cost or, you know, a utilization type of thing. Sometimes our units want to know about it. So I can spin it all up together um, and really incorporate maybe some of the things that they're looking for at the same time what we're looking for. I would also suggest, you know, keeping the devs uh, by the time you're ready to launch almost close to the prod so that way when you you don't launch two different things yeah. right um and so that way your prod is pretty solidified um and you don't maybe have some of those like as much testing yeah no and, and i think one of the things that i've seen in my experience too is is you're spot on i think treating the, the actual development and in production environments very similarly i think in trying to maybe not stifle some of that true uh cutting edge innovation um, may also be to consider having, you know, sandbox instances where, you know, maybe they aren't connected to, you know, so much uh, with direct connect, inter you know, to internet ability mm -hmm. for access and having those development teams maybe try and experiment new things, but then coming back and partnering, like you guys talked about earlier with the security architecture team to say, okay, this is something we found we think will be useful, but how do we make sure that it's something that we can live with if it was to go into the wild in our environment? Yeah. yeah. There were I would say QA does. There you go. Yeah. yeah, real quick, of course, I'm sure all the security uh, folks on here have seen this before, but, you know, devs love to try to use their production data production, uh, you know, in development usually uh -huh. you know, because it, it's a lot of work, obviously, to try to clean up a data set to get all the, you know, sensitive data out. But that's the big, you know, make sure that if you have that dev environment, you try to keep it completely isolated from from anything else because I mean I mean, we've seen it here you know we've definitely done a good job of mitigating it but yeah. um, you're going to get that that request so just try to if you do you know loosen those restrictions make sure you don't have any prod data sets in there great great <laughs> recommendation <laughs> yeah I, I do have a you know as we've talked about it um, a question do you, when you guys uh, do go through that IAC process, um, so you talked about the checklist. Do you guys ever fail a build? I mean, do you literally stop and fail the build itself or do you just provide cautions that it's going to get remediated autonomously once in production? I'm a tough puppy. I'll say that if I won't let things go and let, I, I mean, there's some things that I can be flexible about, right? Okay, we can do this after. And then there's some things where I will not, I will not budge unless it's taken care of. Yeah, and they, they, you know, developers do like to, to push the envelope with, with some of the things because, I mean, at the end of the day, they have their own, you know, everybody gets pushed to meet certain deadlines, but there are just certain things that you really just have to, you know, have to be strict about and put your foot down. And oh, a big item there that's helped us uh, about a year ago, we did kind of finalize a, a cloud security policy just with baseline items. Okay. So we kind of get sent out to everybody. I think that's super important just to say, you know, you, these are like the critical things that you just absolutely can't do. So once you, you know, I'm definitely not not a big policy pusher by any means, but it's good just to have that as a baseline. So everybody understands, all right, definitely can't do this. And that'll usually eliminates some of the silly things you, or requests you used to see coming in. And the, the policy, the checklist and the box, they all are very consistent. Yeah. Great to know. Great to know. Well, guys, I can't thank you enough. Jeremiah, Sadie, it's been great having you here today and providing us all the insights about how you guys have driven friction-free innovation at Viacom CBS. Thank you so much for being a part of today's session. Yep. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So, look, before you leave, I got a few, a few additional announcements. Right after this session, uh, let me go ahead and click here. We are going to be, and by the way, thanks for uh, thanks for everybody's input. Coming up next, we uh, you, you heard Sadie and Jeremiah talk about all the innovative ways that they're actually utilizing the Divi Cloud product. Why not come learn a little bit more about the product itself? So coming up next, uh, we, we've got Alex Kostorfin doing a live demo of, of Divi Cloud by Rapid7 itself. And then after that, uh, you're going to want to make sure to also come back at 12, right around 12 o'clock. 
um, actually the, the GCP team, we've got Anton, Anjali, and Morgan uh, talking about some insider insights about how GCP thinks about security themselves. So you're gonna wanna make sure you come to the demo next, uh, GCP session after that. And don't forget, be here at the end of the day today where I'm going to be drawing two raffle winners for either a Galaxy, or excuse me, Samsung or Apple Watch. So you'll wanna be live there for that. But again, thanks so much, Jeremiah, Sadie. Great having you guys on the team. Yep. And we'll talk to you. Thanks, again. guys. Take care.